Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Mallor Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu and by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. Coronavirus cases in Indiana are soaring and state health officials warn the worst is still to come. The state is preparing for a surge in patients by allowing unlicensed health care workers to practice. Indiana's rural counties have very limited resources to respond to the coronavirus. At least 16 counties don't have a hospital or ICU beds. But the economics of that are not going to play out for very long in a way that will allow many, many small hospitals or any, anyone with fragile finances to survive. And the coronavirus is disrupting the justice system. I directed all of my lawyers that they were not to visit prisons or jails as of last week and um, that they were to telework. Ahead, the juggling act to preserve people's rights while protecting public health and maintaining order. Those stories plus the latest news headlines from across the state right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. Kids in grades K through 12 aren't going back to school this year. They'll finish from home, either working online or completing take-home materials. The cancellation of the rest of the school year is probably the largest ever disruption in K through 12 education. More than 1.1 million Hoosier students will be affected, as well as their parents and teachers. Our goal, given this very difficult situation, is to ensure that students have some type of continuous learning. It may not all be e-learning, but we are, we are hopeful that we can um, offer some type of continuous learning to all of our kids. The state says the move is necessary to curb the spread of the coronavirus. McCormick acknowledges no one was prepared to enter a situation where students would be learning at home rather than in the classroom. She says a lot of the details will be worked out over the coming days. What are we going to do with that skill gap that obviously has come over the last few months and will continue on through the end of the year? And then our concern again is summer into next fall. But our goal is to look at our resources, understand our capacity so that we can address those gaps. My colleague Jeannie Lindsay joins me now from the newsroom. You know, the decision to close schools for the remainder of the year wasn't entirely unexpected, but there's still no way schools can be prepared for this. Can you help us understand what happens now? Yeah, it's a big shift. Um, school buildings will be closed through the end of the school year unless in a past executive order they were told to be open to offer things like child care for essential workers. Now, the governor already gave schools a 20-day waiver, so instead of 180 required days of instruction, the number is now 160. How much longer does that mean most students will have to learn from home? Right, so the 20 days are kind of a buffer. Schools can decide how to use those, but it's basically to ease the pressure for this huge transition that everyone's making. So schools don't have to provide instruction on those 20 waiver days, and they can use those for professional development. But again, it's up to every local school to decide how they want to be teaching students right now. Teachers have been putting together a patchwork of lessons for students. What guidance are they getting from the state when setting expectations? Right, so obviously we heard from Jennifer McCormick who's expecting some sort of continued learning to keep going. So the state has been providing a lot of technical um, support and they've been hosting webinars and trying to share resources and tools. Um, so they've been letting schools kind of determine locally how they'll serve students, but there is an expectation that learning will continue and they've been trying to play that supporting role to help with some of the, the technical lifts on that. Jeannie, are students able to check enough boxes, so to speak, that they'll be able to you know, move on to the next grade without any issues, or will there have to be remedial learning next year? And then what about graduating seniors? 
Right, so the executive order that came down this week um, eases the graduation requirements for the 2020 cohort just a little bit. Um, for students who haven't taken their graduation exam, they don't have to take it if they haven't already. And then they'll get credit, uh, high school seniors will get credit for uh, courses that they're enrolled in right now, as long as they're meeting those engagement and um, instructional thresholds um, set by their teachers. So as long as they're participating, they'll get to um, receive credit for courses they're enrolled in. And then the summer school question and remedial in the fall is another huge thing that schools are going to have to address. So um, we'll see how that plays out. Jeannie, we have to go, but really quick, how are teachers and students reacting to the school closing? There's a lot of heartbreak, but there's also some hope. A lot of people have been coming together. Um, I talked to a senior in Crawfordsville who wrote a song with a friend, um, and we have a clip of that that we can watch. So definitely a lot of challenges with this, but um, to some bright spots too. All right, Jeannie, thank you very much. Yep. Well, some Indiana morgues are bringing in refrigerated trucks. The state is allowing unlicensed medical workers to practice, and there's a rush to try and double the number of ICU beds in the state. The governor and the state health commissioner are providing daily briefings on the state's response to the virus. They say despite the more than 3,400 confirmed cases in Indiana, the worst is still yet to come. The health commissioner says the virus won't peak for a couple more weeks, but some models put the date closer to the end of May. I do not want Hoosiers to see these rising numbers and think that that means that the peak has arrived. We have a very long way to go before we reach the peak, and I cannot say enough about how important it is for you to continue to stay home. Bach says Indiana hospitals have increased their intensive care unit capacity by about one-third in the past few weeks, which gives the state just short of 2,000 beds. Bach says the Army Corps of Engineers is also on standby to help set up field hospitals if the current facilities can't handle the influx of patients. Our hope is that we never need this, but we must prepare as if we will. Big cities are getting hit the hardest by the coronavirus right now. Nearly half of Indiana's confirmed cases are in Marion County. There are only a handful of Indiana counties that aren't reporting any positive cases of the virus, and all of them are in rural areas. About a third of Indiana counties are rural. People are more spread out and naturally practice a little more social distancing, but the virus is still spreading to these communities. And as Brock Turner reports, the challenges facing medical systems across the country is even more acutely felt in these rural areas. Cities and towns are eerily quiet as residents seek to comply with Governor Eric Holcomb's stay at home order. While it might be easier for residents to be less congregated in these areas, health systems here just aren't meant to handle a pandemic. Indianapolis has a population of nearly 900,000 people, but cares for them with several hospitals and a handful of trauma centers. Estimates show the city has access to over 500 trauma beds, and that number could increase. Compare that to Adams County, which was one of the first rural communities in the state that reported a case of COVID-19, and the differences are glaring. The county's population is about 35,000, and they only have a single hospital. 16 counties in Indiana don't have a single bed or hospital. The majority of Indiana's rural communities are served by critical access hospitals. They have to abide by all sorts of federal regulations, including limitations on their size. And while some of those regulations have been loosened recently, usually the maximum number of inpatient beds they can have is 25, and most are only equipped with a few ICU beds. You know, I think the challenges are that our resources don't run very deep. The Greene County General Hospital CEO Brenda Reese says there are a number of things her hospital is trying to overcome. Those include issues with capacity, medical supplies, and staffing. You know, with larger facilities, um, it, you can, you have more, more depth to your staffing pool. You have more depth to your, your supply chain. Um, and in, in communities like this, you're maybe one or two layers deep uh, at all. Um, but I also acknowledge that that is somewhat proportionate. An executive order from Governor Eric Holcomb now allows retired health care workers, along with graduating med students and out-of-state practitioners, to help care for the potential surge in COVID-19 patients. We're working to increase the workforce and remove barriers to retired health care providers returning to work in some capacity. Personnel and equipment are obviously needed to address this crisis. 
Reed's staff has gone to extraordinary lengths to find equipment. Yep, we're right there. We've, we've been to the local hardware stores and we've um, checked out their inventory and yes, we have. She also worries about the number of ventilators. The first several orders that we placed were um, declined um, because of back order. So while we have a few right now on order, we haven't received them. So, and it, it's a, uh, we don't count that we have anything until it comes in the drawer. Hospitals have begun operating and reporting in their public health preparedness districts. That allows facilities to pool resources in hopes of bettering patient outcomes and helping manage a potential influx of patients. But to make matters worse, the finances of many hospitals are also taking a hit. Facilities usually rely on elective and outpatient procedures paid for by private insurance companies to boost their revenues. The emergency services they provide typically don't add revenue and cost a lot to maintain. That's causing concern as many hospitals cancel elective procedures to prepare for an influx of COVID-19 patients. Many of our rural hospitals, the, are the largest share of their payment, the revenue they receive, comes from government sources, Medicare and Medicaid, that pays well below the cost of delivering those services. Tabor says he worries that some hospitals could even close. But the economics of that are not going to play out for very long in a way that will allow many, many small hospitals or any, anyone with fragile finances to survive. Executives agree it's difficult financially, but for now, more are focused on the short run. For REITs, it's not her facility's finances that are keeping her up at night. Rather, it's her employees, many of which are friends and neighbors. First and foremost, it is our staff safety. I, I worry they, they put their, you know, their lives on the line every day when they come to work, and that seems a little dramatic on most days, but in, in a scenario like this, it, it really is true, and, and I appreciate what they do, and I just want to keep them safe. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Brock Turner. Advocates for the homeless in Bloomington and Monroe County say they're moving quickly to address a potential COVID-19 outbreak in their shelters. A group of local shelters and community groups is setting up an isolation shelter for people showing signs of the new coronavirus. George Hale reports. Reverend Forrest Gilmore is the director of the Shalom Community Center. He says efforts by his group and others will not only help individuals needing shelter, but also lower the risk of infection for the community at large. The site of the planned isolation center is a portion of a 150,000-square-foot warehouse parallel to the Beeline Trail south of downtown Bloomington. The isolation center can handle up to 60 people and will occupy part of the warehouse. Just, it's really important for people to remember this is a life and death emergency. We're, we're in the business of saving lives, and not just to the people who come to the shelter, but, the, but reducing the potential spread throughout our whole community. That is, uh, is, is vital because the more uh, people get this, the more dangerous it is for the rest of our uh, city and, and country. And so that's, that's the, the heart of this. A separate part of the building houses the Rising Star Gymnastics Club. It's about 180 feet from the shelter, and although the club is closed due to the outbreak, the owner is concerned about sharing restroom facilities with the shelter, and she worries that the isolation center will affect her ability to reopen once the crisis passes. For Indiana News Desk, I'm George Hale. Well, more than 1 in 20 Hoosier workers have lost their jobs since the coronavirus pandemic forced the closure of restaurants, bars, and other businesses. People are struggling, and more of them are forced to turn to food pantries for meals. As Venta Boutier reports, pantries are finding it nearly impossible to meet the growing demand and adapt to the extra precautions they need to take to slow the spread of the virus. Amanda Nicky is the president and CEO of Mother Hubbard's Cupboard, a nonprofit food provider in Bloomington. She says the pantry started to see an influx in patrons a couple of weeks ago from people working in industries that are closing or limiting their services, like food and construction. Last week alone, we provided the amount of food that we would provide in a month, in one week. The pantry has moved to a drive through model where customers drive up in their car and a staff member places a box of food in their trunk. That might change in the future as this progresses and... People are, you know, isolating themselves and, and are maybe out of the woods, so to speak. The pantry is limiting the days it's open to Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday from noon to 2 p.m. and 4 to 6 p.m. Just to make it more manageable for the staff that we have, knowing that we might have to do this for a long time and we need to set a pace that we know we can maintain. 
She says even though they've been limiting their food donations to what they get from the Hoosier Hills Food Bank, this could change if need continues to grow. Nikki says the financial impact could reach up to five years out because they've had to cancel their largest fundraiser this year in response to the coronavirus. Nikki says they're in need of cardboard boxes and financial donations to continue operating. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Ben Taboutier. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Judges are being asked to avoid holding in-person hearings ahead the balance between maintaining public order and protecting people's rights and their health. And folks are getting creative in order to provide more health care workers with protective equipment. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. The WTIU WFIU News Team connects Indiana to the world. We bring you the top news of the day on radio, TV, and online. We round up the stories that have people talking each week and dig deep into the issues that affect your community the most. The WTIU WFIU News Team is where you are and telling your story. In a time of change, where can you find in-depth reporting and thoughtful analysis? Washington Week on PBS. Join moderator Robert Costa. When I was at the Capitol this week, I encountered the same... And a panel of award-winning journalists. You're seeing a divided nation and you're seeing... For insights and perspective. Tonight there was a key development in the You Senate won't find Congress. anywhere else. What a week. Washington Week. Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. Jury trials have come to a halt throughout Indiana and state and federal courts as the judicial system tries to deal with fallout from the coronavirus. Attorneys are having a really difficult time adapting to the technology and making sure they're adequately representing their clients. Adam Pinsker has the story. Enshrined in the U.S. Constitution, the right to a speedy trial is one of the most important parts of our democracy, but it's not unprecedented for that right to be suspended temporarily during trying times like we're facing now. During the Katrina, the Hurricane Katrina disaster, um, trials were suspended in, um, in federal courts in New Orleans as well as in state courts for some period of time. Monica Foster is a federal chief public defender for Indiana's Southern District, which stretches from Indianapolis to Evansville. The Southern District of Indiana is one of the top, th is one of the most um, overburdened systems in the entire United States of America. Last month, the district ordered that all civil and jury trials be continued, the legal term for delayed. The Northern District, which covers Lafayette to South Bend and Hammond, issued the same order. It also approved video and or teleconferencing for detention hearings, initial appearances, and arraignments. Foster is hoping the same arrangement can be made for the Southern District. There's a discussion underway about trying to do those via video conferencing, where the defendants are incarcerated pre-trial, um, and to try and limit as much as possible any sort of face-to-face -face contact between anyone. Foster says all of her lawyers have been teleworking since the middle of March. It's almost the exact arrangement in the Marion County judicial system. John Gallo of the Marion County Public Defender's Office is not a fan. To adequately represent someone, you need to have face-to-face -face contact with them. Um, to zealously represent somebody, you need to have a lot of face-to-face -face contact with them and make sure that they understand who you are. Gallo says Marion County is only handling initial hearings, bond reviews, and guilty pleas. This will ensure defendants aren't incarcerated without a trial date. The people that are being released are the kinds of people that are on um, either nonviolent misdemeanors, or low-level level felonies. Those accused of sex crimes or violent crimes will remain behind bars, their trial dates postponed indefinitely. While I am extremely sympathetic to the fact that some people are going to be waiting in custody longer than they would have to get their day in court, um, I'm not sure the backlog is going to be incredibly onerous. But in the busy southern Indiana Federal District, Foster says jail overcrowding was already an issue before the coronavirus slowed down the judicial system. I have voiced my concerns about the prison in, prisons and jails um, in our district and incarcerating people pre-trial to anybody who will listen and quite a few people who will not listen. State Supreme Court Chief Justice Loretta Rush is asking courts in all of Indiana's 92 counties to submit a plan for how they will operate during the governor's emergency orders regarding coronavirus. 
In the meantime, the High Court will not have any oral arguments for the month of April. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Adam Pinsker. The court will review next week whether it should suspend jury trials beyond the current May 4th date. It has the ability to petition for an extension if it's deemed necessary because of the coronavirus crisis. Well, many 3D printing labs and private owners of 3D printers are making efforts to help fill shortages of medical equipment during the COVID-19 pandemic. Benta Boutier reports the Fibers and Additive Manufacturing and Able Systems Lab, known as FAMES at Indiana University, is among those trying to help meet the need for medical equipment. Alexander Guminik is an assistant professor of intelligence systems engineering who heads the FAMES lab. Guminik says he started to get requests last week from people asking if he could use the 3D printers in his lab to make different types of medical equipment. Since then, Guminik says he and his students have produced a working prototype of protective face shields, which they are sending to doctors and nurses at Eskenazi Hospital in Indianapolis. So the first thing to send them was uh, the face shield. That was the fastest to make, uh, fastest to try and approve, and now it's approved, and it went to a mass production. Guminik says he and his students can print 20 face shields a day in his lab. He says they also sent a few models of nasal swabs for COVID-19 test kits to be tried out by doctors at Eskenazi Hospital. Louis Vanderhelst is one of Guminik's PhD students who's been helping design and produce prototypes of the nasal swabs. He says the models they've sent are based off of swabs already in use, but with minor adjustments made to see if they can improve existing models. I try to replicate what's currently being used, and with that we can have a good grasp of exactly what kind of devices we need to, to develop. So our swabs are, are not uh, completely new, they're, they're based on concrete designs that have been tested. Vanderhelst says he thinks approval of swab design for Eskenazi doctors is near. And once um, we get feedback from the hospital, from the uh, medical doctors, we can optimize that. And if they approve of a design, we must produce it. The time frames are very different in terms of prototyping and mass producing. We can prototype um, over a day, but mass production can take up to three days. Guminik says between the printers in his lab and a few others across campus, they'll be able to produce up to 5,000 swabs a week once the design is approved. He says usually his lab's work is much more research-based, but the skills he and his students have to use for this project make for good real-world application of their studies. The character of work has changed, but the knowledge and the uh, equipment are the same knowledge and equipment that we use for research. He says he and his students feel good that they can be uniquely useful at a time where many labs and programs and universities have been shut down. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Ben Taboutier. It's been almost three weeks since Indiana's governor closed all the state's restaurants and bars. The impact has been devastating for some small businesses and their employees. But during this crazy and uncertain time, we're hearing stories of great kindness, sacrifice and generosity. Some restaurant owners have been preparing meals for their out-of-work employees every day. Others are pledging to pay their workers for as long as they can. As Adam Pinsker reports, they say it comes down to simply doing the right thing. I could possibly work it out. A 20-year veteran of the service industry, Justin Jones opened Volvo Conti Coffee in October, and he values his employees' hard work. I've worked for several different companies uh, who all stressed quality of life being very important to them. Um, but there was some lip service. So Jones is putting his money where his mouth is and paying his employees during the time his cafe is closed. Their financial well-being is an extension of their personal well-being and vice versa. A total of 12 employees at Bova Conti and at the other coffee shop in Indianapolis that Jones owns, Georgia Street Grind, will be getting paid during the hiatus. It's not like another situation where uh, we had to lay people off because business was down and maybe they could go find another job. Uh, this is a different scenario. Jones says it's amazing to watch how some of his employees are paying it forward. The response has been incredible. I mean, we've had some people said, hey, I've got myself in a situation where I'm financially stable. I would like for you to, to take my portion and bleed it over into someone else. Jones says he hopes some other small businesses are able to compensate their employees during this crisis. He believes investing in his employees will create a happy, healthy, 
and positive work environment. From day one, I have wanted to be different and I've wanted to approach the hospitality business from a different standpoint. Jones says with some financial peace of mind, he's hoping his employees and others will make the most out of the downtime. Whatever it is that we connect to, I feel like uh, a lot of people have maybe gotten quite disconnected from that. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Adam Pinsker. And nearly half of Indiana's public school children receive free or reduced price lunches. And schools like in Brown County are doing what they can to keep providing meals despite ongoing school closures. Families register online to pick up at distribution locations or for homebound deliveries. Food service, custodial, administration, and transportation officials are all part of the grab-and-go meal program. Brown County School Superintendent Laura Hammock says funding comes from the federal government. The feds really had some nice food service um, arrangements already for any kind of extended closure. So we do it in the summer anyway. It's called our summer servings program. Meal distribution is Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 11 a.m. until 2. That's the end of this program, but our work continues online at WTIUNews.org. Stay safe and have a great week. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Mallor Grodner Attorneys providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you.